Good evening, this is Matt Bautista and welcome to our Bible study here in Faith Baptist Church, South Metro. Before we proceed with our lesson tonight, let us first go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you for this opportunity to hear from your word and study. We pray, Lord, that you'd grant us wisdom and understanding and insight also. May you be done to lead us, guide us into learning, Father. May bless our time together and all of this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So tonight, we're continuing our study on, or our series on journey through his story, and we're on lesson number 43. And tonight, we're going to talk about God's oath to Abraham. This was that time after Abraham offered Isaac, but God stopped him. And then after that, God confirmed his promise to Abraham and then swore an oath to him to conf- to to assure him further of the promises that he has given to him well our text tonight is found in the book of genesis chapter 22 verses 15 to 24 well the lord acknowledged the faith of abraham he spared isaac and provided a substitute for the burnt offering remember that ram that was caught in 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 a thicket by by its thorns because god still provided a an a, a lamb for for an offering that he required at that time and after that god swore to fulfill all his promises to abraham and his descendants he swore an oath to him well let's read our text tonight well after god stopped abraham from uh Killing Isaac, and then after Abraham has offered that ram that was provided by the Lord, the angel of the Lord, or Jesus Christ, called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, By myself, on the basis of who I am, on the basis of God's character, his integrity, I have sworn an oath, declares the Lord, that since you have done this thing, Willing, willingly offered Isaac and have not withheld from me your son, your only son of promise. Indeed, I will greatly bless you and I will greatly multiply your descendants like the stars of the heavens and like the sand on the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies as conquerors. Through your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have heard and obeyed my voice so abraham returned to his servants uh, and they got up and went with him to beersheba and abraham settled in beersheba now after these things abraham was told milka has born children to your brother nahor who's the firstborn and booz his brother and Kemuel, the father of Aram, Kesed and Hazel and Pildash and Jidlaf and Bethuel. Bethuel. Bethuel became the father of Rebekah. These eight children Milcah bore to Nahor, Abraham's brother, and we'll talk more about that later. Nahor's concubine, whose name was Ruma, gave birth to Teba and Geham and Tehash or Tahash and Makkah. So, let's learn a few things tonight from our passage and see some principles from the oath that God has given to Abraham and also Abraham's obedience, his remarkable obedience to God. Well, first, God declares his oath to Abraham after everything that has happened. God swore by his integrity and there is no greater assurance of an oath than the integrity of God. Let's read Hebrews um, chapter 6, verses 13 to 14. And this is what the writer has got to say about God's swearing an oath by himself. For when God made the promise to Abraham, referring to that incident that we're talking about, he swore an oath by himself, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, saying, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply you. And 
we even as human beings do that, right? I swear by by, by some by by my mother, by my father. I swear by by this or that something great that they could um kind of use as some sort of assurance that um someone would take um to be serious if you made mention of it. So God, since there's no one else, there's nothing greater than he 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 than he himself. So he swore by his own integrity. So by myself, I swear to you, Abraham. And he cannot deny himself in Second Timothy two thirteen, right? And the Lord said, uh, the writer also said it. Uh, Paul in his letter to Timothy said that God cannot deny himself. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, true to his word and his righteous character, for he cannot deny himself. So when God made this promise to Abraham, when he swore an oath to him and swore by his integrity, by himself, it was as a, it was a sealed deal. It was the greatest assurance that Abraham could have ever asked for because when he did that, then he can no longer deny himself. He never was he, he never did deny himself, but it's just another assurance, another stamp of assurance for Abraham. Well, the Lord emphasized the promise he gave concerning Abraham and his descendants. He emphasized because he already told Abraham this several times already, right? As we have um, seen in the life of Abraham, as we went on that journey with starting from Abraham, to Abraham, right? We've heard the Lord promise Abraham and even confirmed, restated, tell, told him time and again the promises that he had and the plan that he had for Abraham and his descendants. So he, he just emphasized it at this time. And here's some, a commentary from David Guzik in his study, Abraham is willing to offer Isaac a continuation uh, of that study. Here's what he had to say about it. Abraham's obedience was based on trust in God's promise to bring descendants through Isaac. Therefore, God repeated and emphasized the promise after Abraham's remarkable obedience. So it's not as if God hadn't told him this before, but he wanted to emphasize it, to acknowledge or to recognize Abraham's remarkable obedience. Again, he was making a statement to Abraham, to Isaac probably, and to everyone who would hear about this account, about this incident that had happened in Abraham's life so that people will know the faith of Abraham and more than that, the faithfulness of God. And another blessing was revealed regarding the Lord's promise to Abraham's seed. Remember, God told Abraham, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make a great nation out of you. Your descents will be numerous. You, you can count them as numerous as the stars in the sky, even the sands, right? Yeah. And he told them that he, he even told Abraham and Sarah that kings will be, will be coming from their descendants. But here's another, another thing that the Lord has revealed to them about his plan for Abraham's descendants. Your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies as conquerors. This was not stated before. So aside from being numerous, aside from being um, a great nation, aside from making Abraham's name great, aside from having kings from, the, from their lineage, they would also conquer you know, territories. That's going to be part of God's plan for them. And here's a commentary from Matthew Henry on Genesis 22 about this concept thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies believers by their faith overcome the world and triumph over all the powers of darkness and are more than conquerors now talking about abraham's spiritual descendants those who believed in the lord jesus christ as their lord and savior you if you believed in the lord jesus christ you're a, a spiritual descendant of abraham and you are more than a conqueror spiritually speaking so God has revealed this promise to him. Again, an additional um, information about the plan that he has for Abraham's seed. So the promise is just getting greater and greater as um, the Lord is revealing more and more about his plan to Abraham. Excuse me. 
And then God acknowledged Abraham's obedience and confirmed his blessing. Now here's a comment, another commentary from Matthew Henry. God is pleased to make mention of Abraham's obedience as the consideration of the covenant. And he speaks of it with an encomium or a tribute. Because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, he lays a strong emphasis on this and praises it as an act of obedience. In it thou hast obeyed my voice, and to obey is better than sacrifice. So the, the obedience of Abraham was more than, than the sacrifice that um, could be offered to him. It was actually the best sacrifice that we can give God, our obedience. Because we surrender, we sacrifice our own desires in exchange for his plan for our lives. Now that this was a proportionable consideration, not that this was a proportionable consideration, but God graciously put this honor upon that by which Abraham had honored him. And another commentary from Matthew Henry, God now confirmed the promise with an oath First, it was just um, promised. Well, it's not as if it wasn't enough, but God wanted to confirm it once more with an oath. He swore an oath to Abraham. It was said that uh, it was said and sealed before, but now it is sworn. By myself have I sworn, for he could swear by no greater. So again, it's like Abraham has been given a promise, an assurance, and then another assurance, and then uh, a, a seal of confirmation and another certification and and then now an, another promise uh, an oath sworn by god by himself so abraham at this time no longer had any reason to doubt god's promise to him and abraham returned to his servants with isaac just as he said remember he told the, the servants that i and the lad will go by ourselves to worship the Lord and then we we will come back and then they came back they went there they went back both of them with the servants and then after they went back to Beersheba and settled there so that's what happened after after Abraham's wonderful display of obedience and faith in the Lord God honored him and God made a declaration of his obedience and also swore an oath to him, confirming his promise. And this was passed on from generation to generation in their family. And then later on, compiled into accounts recorded by Moses and the other writers in the Old Testament. And then many years after, Jesus came and his life was recorded also. And after that, parts of their journal were all compiled and put together and then became, to, became what we know today as the Bible, the completed canon of Scripture. before all of this that we have today well all of the things had to happen first so that they could be recorded in one one momentous one momentous event in the history of mankind was that moment when abraham completely surrendered to the will of god and after that, there was a news, a news to, to Abraham about Nahor's children. Now, why was this important? Well, let's talk about it for a while. Uh, it was told that Milcah has born children to Nahor, Abraham's brother. Abraham was told. Well, probably it was natural because it was his family, so Abraham was told about it. Now, if you remember, Nahor stayed in Ur of the Chaldeans while Abraham left with their father Terah. In Genesis chapter 11, you may read the passage in your own time. But remember, right, that there, there were three sons that um, Terah had, Abraham and Nahor and Haran. 
Well, Haran, Abraham's other brother, besides Nahor, he was the father of Lot. And he died, remember? In Ur of the Chaldeans before they left for Canaan, before even Abraham and Terah left for Canaan. That's why Terah took Lot with them because his father had died and they took care of him. And later on, Abraham uh, took him under his wing. There was still one more brother that Abraham had, and he stayed in, in, their, in their homeland in the Ur of the Chaldeans. And the news that um, he had children, his wife um, brought, um, has borne him children, was, was given to Abraham. Now, why was this important? Because one of Nahor's sons, Bethuel, became the father of Rebekah. Now, who was Rebekah? She would later on become Isaac's wife. And there would be um, some criteria that Abraham would set when he asked his servant to go and find someone, find a woman that Isaac could wed. And this, this part of the account, because well, what's the reason for including this account? It, it's not necessarily important, right? But it, it, it actually was because uh, Abraham asked his servant to go find someone for Isaac to marry. And he, he, he gave some criteria. And this gives us a background as to why Rebecca later qualified to be Isaac's wife. Well, before we close, let's see some spiritual insights and principles in the passage that um, we have for tonight. Well, first of all, the assurance of our hope in God's promise. Let's continue that, that passage in Hebrews chapter 6. Well, this time we'll be reading from verse 13 all the way to verse 18 because again this is referring to the the, the the account that we're discussing tonight the time when God made or when God swore an oath to Abraham after his offering of Isaac and this is what it says for when God made a promise to Abraham he swore an oath by himself since he had no one greater by whom to swear saying I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply you and so Having patiently waited, he realized the promise in the miraculous birth of Isaac as a pledge of what was to come from God. Indeed, men swear an oath by one greater than themselves, and with them in all disputes, the oath serves as confirmation of what has been said and is an end of the dispute. In the same way, God, in his desire to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable nature of his purpose intervened and guaranteed it with an oath. So it's not as if he, he, he hasn't said it before or that his promise wasn't enough, but he wanted to give further guarantee to Abraham so that by two unchangeable or immutable things, his promise and his, promise and his oath, in which it is impossible for God to lie, it's not in his nature because he is truth, we who have fled to him for refuge would have strong encouragement and indwelling strength to hold tightly to the hope that is set before us. The hope that we have in Jesus Christ, the hope that we have in God's word, the hope that we have in the promises of God that we learn from the scriptures. We can, we, we can hold firmly or tightly onto those things and we can trust it because God when he, when he makes a promise, he promises and he, he makes an oath by none greater than himself, the greatest being there is. Well, God swore to keep his promise to bless Abraham and his descendants. Again, not just his biological descendants, but also his spiritual descendants. So somehow we are also included in that oath, in that promise when God said, I'm going to bless all the families of the earth through Jesus Christ. And it's not just salvation. There's also life after salvation while we're still here, right? If that was the case, then after being saved, then God would just check us out from, from the earth and bring us all to heaven. But God still has a plan for us after salvation. He wants to bless our life here spiritually and so that we could make an impact in the lives of others and tell others about, about uh, the grace that we have received from Jesus Christ, about the love of God through Jesus Christ and share the eternal life that we have, and also a life that's more abundant through Jesus Christ. So, God swore to keep His promise to bless Abraham and his descendants by the greatest there is. 
himself. And God's oath is a confirmation of his word or his promise. So when he swore that oath, it was confirming or giving us a guarantee of the promises that he has given. Well, in that case, it was for Abraham and his promise to Abraham, but to his spiritual descendants, to the spiritual descendants of Abraham, all the promises that he has given or that we can find in his word, in the scriptures, well, we can trust it because the Lord swore an oath to fulfill all of those. And our God, or our hope, I'm sorry, our hope in the Lord is not misplaced, but firmly established because of His unchanging character. And sometimes, right, maybe we've, does the scripture say that it's foolish to put our trust in, in man? But sometimes when we're desperate or we're in a very difficult situation, we just kind of, or not even in man, but sometimes we put our trust in something else other than God, but because sometimes we, we think that well, well, nothing's happening or I haven't seen God work in, in my life, right? I'm not sure if um, God would spend some time to, to, to resolve this, this, this concern that I have right now. But let's just put our hope in the Lord because it will never be misplaced. Actually, placing our hope in someone else or in something else is the wrong move to make that's actually misplacing our hope but when our hope is placed in the lord then we can be sure that we're placing our hope on something that has a guarantee god's oath god's oath that he swore by himself and the scriptures all say the passage that we have read because it's impossible for him to lie so He'll be sure to fulfill it. And our faith is founded on the faithfulness of God. God is unchanging. It's not just that He doesn't lie. He's truth, right? And He also does not change. So our faith is founded on the faithfulness of God. And God is faithful. Everything that He has promised Abraham, it happened. Everything that He has said in the scriptures, it happened. And everything that he has promised his followers, those who would love him, those who would follow him, those who would obey him, he keeps his promise to them and takes care of them. And Nahor also um, had a concubine, aside from the, that news that was given to Abraham, right? That um, his wife Milka born children to him. There was also another another woman, Ruma, Nahor's concubine. He, she also bore children to Nahor. So, but uh, let's see some insights about this. Well, here's a commentary by David Guzik. This is the first mention of a concubine in the Bible. In addition to his wife Milka, Nahor also took a concubine named Ruma. Now, um, Hagar wasn't necessarily Abraham's uh, concubine, right? Uh, she was the, the the mother of Abraham's son Ishmael, but uh, she was not officially a concubine to, to, a, to Abraham. Now, here's another commentary from David Guzik, and I just thought of um, inserting this, this principle because, or this insight to, to give us some more understanding as to why this was allowed during that time because it was, uh, it was a practice that they did, even, even the patriarchs in, in, the, in the Old Testament. Well, this taking of an additional wife or concubine was recognized as legal and was culturally accepted in the ancient world, including the world Abraham and the patriarchs lived in. However, it was never in God's plan. We know this because of the pattern given in Genesis 2.24, right? That a man should leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. In speaking upon Genesis 2.24 principle, Jesus clearly told us that this was God's intention at the beginning. God never gave a specific command against polygamy until the New Testament, but God showed in principle that it was never his heart. While it was legal, it was not in his heart. It wasn't necessarily right. It wasn't necessarily good. In addition, whenever we see the family life of a polygamous household in the Bible, those families are marked by chaos and conflict. Again, uh, Hagar wasn't even necessarily Abraham's um, official concubine, but see what what happened uh, 
with her and Sarah, right? And, and, and the heartache that it caused Abraham. So it was not in God's intention. It happened, he allowed it, but it was not part of his perfect plan. And um, here's another commentary about it from Matthew Henry. Well, as to why it was inserted in, in, in the chapter in the scriptures, if, if, if we think about it again, uh, besides um, and giving a, a background for Rebecca, well, could there be any other reason uh, for, for, for this, this section to be included in the scriptures? Well, here's some an insight from Matthew Henry. He said, well, to show that though Abraham saw his own family highly dignified and with peculiar privileges, admitted into covenant and blessed with the entail of the promise, yet he did not look with contempt and disdain upon his relations, his family, but was glad to hear of the increase and prosperity of their families. So that was a good thing, right? And uh, it's a good reminder for us, though we, we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ, and though we may be blessed in our lives, it's still good to, to rejoice with, with family, rejoice with brothers and sisters in Christ, and even rejoice with, with, with our friends, and opening an opportunity for us to share our faith to, to friends who may, or even family who may still have not believed in the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, right? So it's, there's nothing wrong with that, and Abraham did so. He, he accepted the news and probably rejoiced with the blessing of children in their household. And that's a good insight and uh, should tell us we rejoice with the others we don't we don't, don't get let's not be, be be sad about the good things happening in the lives of others let's rejoice with them because we see the blessing of god in their lives just as the lord has blessed our lives we, we rejoice with others when when the lord is blessing their lives as well and that gives a good testimony because if we really are god's people then we would like to, to, to share God's grace, right, with others, and we want to see, to see the grace of God poured out in the lives of others as well. Again, it's different for each one. God, God blesses each family, each individual differently. So let us just accept the blessings from the Lord and rejoice for those who have been blessed, even in a different way. Again, it's just um, an, an interesting insight from Matthew Henry. Well, to conclude, the hope that we have. In God and His promises are sure, for it is based on an oath sworn by the greatest being there is. Because of this, we may also look forward to the blessing of being obedient to God's calling and leading in our lives. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for the assurance that we have in you, in your perfect character, your promises, Lord, that you have sworn by yourself thank you because we can trust in who you are and thank you because you have given us promises in your word that we may hold tightly on to lord i pray for your guidance and leading in our lives help us to walk with you and help us to trust you always we thank you for your grace and your faithfulness and all of this we pray in jesus name Amen. Thank you very much for your time and may you join us again next time as we learn from God's word.